Ooh, I see a bee and a cafe already. Hey, cuties. I'm just getting a couple of uh, final pieces set up here, so uh, I'll be just a moment before I'm really ready to get started. But we're going to get there. Um, I believe Kira calls this buffer time. Um, so thank you for your patience with me. Okay, so it's only the mods that call it buffer time, and thank you for the comment on me being adorable, Caffrey. I appreciate it. Let's, uh... Go ahead and switch the music over here. And be sure to let me know whether... <laughs> oh, thank you, Legal. I always appreciate the hugs. Um, be sure to let me know whether or not the volume is uh, at a reasonable level for you, please. Um, but yes, I had a day that involved a lot of communication errors, a lot of uh, driving to places that I had absolutely no reason to go, and then being told to hurry up and get somewhere else. It was a day. Oh, I go in the cute box. You know what? I think I might even have a cute box. Oh, I sound like I'm speaking over an intercom. Hmm. Let me make sure that my audio settings are correct here. It's a little bit odd. Um... Hmm. Is this any better? No, that's probably still causing issues. Strange. Does it... Alright. Uh, is that any better? Does that sound a little bit closer to, like, what we expect here? And Legal, thank you so much. Oh, you're being far too kind to me. <laughs> and B, hello. It's really good to see you. Thank you for dropping in. Um, Kefir, does that sound any better? Uh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> Kefir, thank you for the ditto. Uh, does it still sound like I'm coming in over an intercom, though? I sound fine. Okay. Um, boo -boo -boo. All right. Um... Well, so like I said, I had a bit of a day of it, and I figured what better way to finish out a nonsense day than with a book that has its own share of nonsense and a little bit to navigate. Um, hmm. Let me... Uh... Let me try a couple of things here real quick, just to... Well, I'd like to know, because I want my audio quality to be decent here. Yeah, I think I see what you mean. The, I think the gain's actually just up a little bit too high. Um, ba -ba -ba. All right. Hello once again, everybody. Mm, that didn't seem to quite do it. Let's try one more time. All right, well, big hug for you too, Legal. What a good bear. Um, all right. So, uh, yeah, let's... I will just put the music back on and let's get back into it. <laughs> 
drawing and playing a game? Well, I'm very happy to be your backing track then. So, uh, tonight's story is going to be Alice's Adventures in Wonderland by Lewis Carroll. Chapter 1. Down the Rabbit Hole Alice was beginning to get very tired of sitting by her sister on the bank, and of having nothing to do. Once or twice she had peeped into the book her sister was reading, but it had no pictures or conversations in it. And what was the use of a book, thought Alice, without pictures or conversations? So she was considering in her own mind, as well as she could, for the hot day made her feel very sleepy and stupid, whether the pleasure of making a daisy chain would be worth the trouble of getting up and picking the daisies, when suddenly a white rabbit with pink eyes ran close by her. There was nothing so very remarkable in that, nor did Alice think it so very much out of the way to hear the rabbit say to itself, Oh dear, oh dear, I shall be late. When she thought it over afterwards, it occurred to her that she ought to have wondered at this, but at the time it all seemed quite natural. But when the rabbit actually took a watch out of its waistcoat pocket and looked at it, and then hurried on, Alice started to her feet, for it flashed across her mind that she had never before seen a rabbit with either a waistcoat pocket or a watch to take out of it. And burning with curiosity, she ran across the field after it, and fortunately was able to see it just in time to pop down a large rabbit hole under the hedge. In another moment, down went Alice after it, never once considering how in the world she was going to get out again. The rabbit hole went straight down like a tunnel for some way, and then dipped suddenly down, so that suddenly that Alice had not a moment to think about stopping herself before she found herself falling down a very deep well. Either the well was very deep, or she fell very slowly, for she had plenty of time as she went down to look about her and to wonder what was going to happen next. First she tried to look down and to make out what she was coming to. Yes, Caffrey, and I'll buy no rabbit. <laughs> But it was too dark to see anything. Then she looked at the sides of the well and noticed that they were filled with cupboards and bookshelves. Here and there she saw maps and pictures hung upon pegs. She took down a jar from one of the shelves she passed. It was labeled Orange Marmalade, but to her great disappointment it was empty. She did not like to drop the jar for fear of killing somebody underneath, so she managed to put it on one of the cupboards as she fell past it. Well, thought Alice to herself, after such a fall as this, I shall think nothing of tumbling downstairs. How brave they'll all think me at home. Why, I wouldn't say anything about it even if I fell off the very top of the house. Which was very likely true. Down, down, down. Would the fall never come to an end? I wonder how many miles I've fallen by this time, she said aloud. I must be getting somewhere near the center of the earth. Uh, let me think. That would be 4,000 miles down, I think? For you see, Alice had learnt several things of the sort in her lessons in the schoolroom, and though she was not a very good opportunity for showing off her knowledge, as there was no one to listen to her, it was still good to practice to say it over. Y yes, that's about the right distance. But then I wonder what latitude or longitude I've gotten to? Alice had no idea what latitude it was, or longitude either, but thought they were quite nice and grand words to say. Presently, she began again. I wonder if I shall fall right through the earth. How funny it'll seem to come out among the people that walk with their heads downward. The antipathies, I think? She was rather glad to see there was no one listening by this time, as it didn't sound at all the right word. But I shall have to ask them what the name of the country is, you know. Please, ma'am, is this New Zealand or Australia? And she tried to curtsy as she spoke. Fancy curtsying as you're falling through the air. Do you think you could manage it? I mean, I probably could. But why would I be falling far enough to consider curtsying, is the better question. And what an ignorant little girl she'll think me for asking... No, it'll never do to ask. 
Perhaps I shall see it written up somewhere. Down, down, down. There was nothing else to do, so Alice soon began talking again. Dinah will miss me very much tonight, I should think. Dinah was the cat. I hope they'll remember her saucer of milk at tea time. Dinah, my dear, I would love it if you were down here with me. There are no mice in the air, I'm afraid. But you might catch a bat. And that's very like a mouse, you know. But do cats eat bats, I wonder? And here, Alice began to get rather sleepy and went on saying to herself in a dreamy sort of way, Do cats eat bats? Do cats eat bats? And sometimes, do bats eat cats? For you see, as she couldn't answer either question, it didn't much matter which way she put it. She felt that she was dozing off, and had just begun to dream that she was walking hand in hand with Dinah and saying to her very earnestly, Now, Dinah, tell me the truth. Did you ever eat a bat? When suddenly, thump, thump, down she came upon a heap of sticks and dry leaves, and the fall was over. Alice was not a bit hurt, and she jumped up on her feet in a moment. She looked up, but it was dark overhead. Before her was another long passage, and the white rabbit was still in sight, hurrying down it. There was not a moment to be lost. Away went Alice like the wind, and was just in time to hear it say as it turned a corner, Oh, my ears and whiskers, how late it's getting! She was close behind it. Oh, thank you for the follow, Lucy. I'm sorry it took me a few minutes to notice that you'd done so. Uh, I don't have any kind of sound alert set up, but... Welcome to the story circle. I'm glad you've decided to join us. She was close behind it when she turned the corner, but the rabbit was no longer to be seen. She found herself in a long, low hall which was lit up by rows of lamps hanging from the roof. There were doors all around the hall, but they were all locked, and when Alice had been all the way down to one side and up the other, trying every door, she walked sadly down the middle, wondering how she was ever to get out again. Suddenly, she came upon a little three-legged table, all made of solid glass. There was nothing on it except a tiny golden key, and Alice's first thought was that it might belong to one of the doors of the hall. Oh, but alas, either the locks were too large or the key was too small, but at any rate, it would not open any of them. Joe's whipping out the cute word in chat, I see. However, on the second time round, she came upon a low curtain she had not noticed before, and behind it was a little door about 15 inches high. She tried the little golden key in the lock, and to her great delight, it fit! Alice opened the door and found that it led to a small passage, not much larger than a rat hole. She knelt down and looked along the passage into the loveliest garden. Oh, uh, Fuyuko, thank you very much for the follow. It's lovely to have you with us here. Um, I don't recognize your username, but I'm glad you've decided to join in. Um, we are simply reading Alice's Adventures in Wonderland tonight. How she longed to get out of that dark hall and wander about those beds of bright flowers. <laughs> Quite the fun spinny emote. Oh, uh, Joe's brought them in. Well, pleasure to meet you all the same. How she longed to get out of that dark hall and wander among the beds of bright flowers and those cool fountains, but she could not even get her head through the doorway. And even if my head would go through thought poor Alice. It would be of very little use without my shoulders. Oh, how I would like to shut up like a telescope. I think I could, if only I knew how to begin. For you see, so many out-of-the-way things had happened lately that Alice had begun to think that very few things indeed were really impossible. There seemed to be no use in waiting by the little door, so she went back to the table, half hoping she might find another key on it, or at any rate, a book of rules for shutting people up like telescopes. This time, she found a little bottle on it, which certainly was not here before, said Alice, and round the neck of the bottle 
was a paper label with the words, Drink Me, beautifully printed on it in large letters. It was all very well to say, Drink Me, but the wise little Alice was not going to do that in a hurry. No, I'll look first and see whether it's marked poison or not. For she had read several nice little histories about children who had got burnt and eaten up by wild beasts and other unpleasant things, all because they would not remember the simple rules their friends had taught them, such as that a red-hot poker will burn you if you hold it too long, and that if you cut your finger very deeply with a knife it usually bleeds. And she had never forgotten that if you drink much from a bottle marked poison, it is almost certain to disagree with you sooner or later. However, this bottle was not marked poison, so Alice ventured to taste it, and finding it very nice, it had, in fact, a sort of mixed flavor of cherry tart, custard, pineapple, roast turkey, coffee, and hot buttered toast. Quite the assortment. She very soon finished it off. What a curious feeling, said Alice. I must be shutting up like a telescope. And so it was indeed. She was now only ten inches high, and her face brightened up at the thought that she was now the right size for going through the little door into that lovely garden. First, however, she waited for a few minutes to see if she was going to shrink any further. She felt a little nervous about this. For it might end, you know, in my going out altogether like a candle. I wonder what I should be like then. And she tried to fancy what the flame of a candle is like after the candle is blown out, for she could not remember ever having seen such a thing. After a while, finding that nothing more happened, she decided on going into the garden at once. But alas, for poor Alice, when she got to the door, she found she had forgotten the little golden key, and when she went back to the table for it, she found she could not possibly reach it. She could see it quite plainly through the glass, and she tried her best to climb up one of the legs of the table, but it was too slippery. And when she had tried herself, tired herself out with trying, the poor little thing sat down and cried. Come, there's no use in talking like that, said Alice to herself rather sharply. I advise you to leave off this minute. She generally gave herself very good advice, though she very seldom followed it and sometimes she scolded herself so severely as to bring tears into her eyes. And once she remembered trying to box her own ears for having cheated herself in a game of croquet that she was playing against herself, for this curious child was fond of pretending to be two people. But it's no use now, thought poor Alice, to pretend to be two people, while well, there's hardly enough left of me to make one respectable person. After all, we all know size matters. Moral of the story, if you find a random bottle of liquid, do not drink it unless you put a sample of it in an analyzer and know for sure what its contents are. <laughs> Kefri to the rescue with the lab-oriented safety measures. Of course, if you're drinking something in a lab, something has already gone terribly wrong. After all, Tommy was a chemist and Tommy is no more, for what he thought was H2O was H2SO4. Soon, her eye fell on a little glass box that was lying under the table. She opened it and found a very small cake on which the words, Eat Me, were beautifully marked in currants. Well, I'll eat it, said Alice. And if it makes me grow larger, I can reach the key. And if it makes me grow smaller, I can creep under the door. So either way, I'll get into the garden, and I don't care which happens. She ate a little bit and said anxiously to herself, which way? Which way? Holding her hand at the top of her head to feel which way she was growing, and she was quite surprised to find that she remained at the same size. To be sure, this generally happens when one eats cake, but Alice had so much into the way of expecting nothing but out-of-the-way things to happen that it seemed quite dull and stupid for life to go on in this common way. So she set to work and very soon finished off the cake. <laughs> yes, Caffrey. Clearly he didn't analyze it. Or try, you know, dipping literally anything into it other than a glass stirring rod. Clearly his fault, yes. But we all know, never drink a liquid in a chemistry lab. And that's not nonsense. That's just a 
good safety measure. Please don't drink things in your chemistry lab. However, we have reached chapter two. So, do we want to continue on with this presently, or do we want to switch over and do a brief song between the chapters so that we don't get bogged down in a single sound? Perfectly fine either way. A bottle with XXX on it? Uh, those are usually alcoholic. I do not recommend alcoholic beverages for young people. Um, for older people, I please drink responsibly. Um, and if it's not something that you're able to walk away from, please, please, please do not start. Um, it, it's... I, I would definitely advise caution. And, yeah... Uh, so that, that would be my recommendation there. Um, and of course, you know, a drop of Nelson's blood wouldn't do us any harm. A drop of Nelson's blood wouldn't do us any harm. Chemical X. Oh dear, Kefri. <laughs> what are you doing with Chemical X? <laughs> quite terrifying, quite terrifying. All right. Well, let's all roll on behind into the pool of tears. Curiouser and curiouser, cried Alice. She was so much surprised that for the moment she quite forgot how to speak good English. Now I'm opening up like the largest telescope that ever was. Goodbye, feet. But when she looked down at her feet, they seemed to be almost out of sight. They were getting so far off. Only oh, poor little feet. I wonder who will put on your shoes and stockings for you now, dears. I'm sure I shan't be able to. I shall be a great deal too far off to trouble myself about you. You must manage the best way you can. But I must be kind to them, thought Alice. Or perhaps they won't walk the way I want to. Oh, let me see. I'll give them a new pair of boots every Christmas. And she went on planning to herself how she would manage it. They must go by the carrier, and how funny it'll seem sending presents to one's own feet, and how odd the directions will look. <laughs> Sugar, spice, chemical... Uh, everything nice in chemical X, B is apparently making Powerpuff Girls. Uh, and Kefri is going for ice spice and everything nice. Well, that's a cooler recipe than I'm used to. <laughs> And um, what are you trying to make with that, Kefri? Is that one of your secret isopod recipes? Alice's right foot, Esquire, hearth rug, near the fender, with Alice's love. Oh dear, what nonsense I'm talking. Kefri always mixes up sugar and ice? Well, ice does fit better with the rhyming scheme, you are not wrong. Um... But if I ask you to put some ice in my drink and you put sugar in, I might be a little bit cross with you. Um, also, those are not two commonly confused objects. So um, I don't have a lot of advice for you, but uh, I, I do like the rhyming pattern a little bit better. And just then, her head struck against the roof of the hall. In fact, she was now more than nine feet high, and she at once took up the little golden key and hurried off to the garden door. Oh, poor Alice. It was as much as she could do, lying down on one side to look through into the garden with one eye. But to get through was more hopeless than ever. She sat down and began to cry again. You ought to be ashamed of yourself, said Alice. A great girl like you, she might as well say this, to go on crying in this way. Stop this moment, I tell you. It's a sacrifice you're willing to take, Kefri. Well, all right, if you're, if you're fine with me being mildly cross with you, I, I suppose then all's well. Although, you haven't actually done it yet, so I'm not 
currently cross with you. Um, I, I just generally am happy that you're my friend and glad you've decided to show up tonight. So, there is that. But she went on all the same, shedding gallons of tears until there was a large pool all around her, about four inches deep and reaching half down the hall. After a time, she heard a little pattering of feet in the distance, and she hastily dried her eyes to see what was coming. It was the white rabbit returning, splendidly dressed with a pair of white kid gloves on one hand and a large fan in the other. He came trotting along in a great hurry, muttering to himself as he came, Oh, the Duchess, the Duchess, oh, won't she be savage if I've kept her waiting? Alice felt so desperate that she was ready to ask help of anyone. So when the rabbit came near her, she began in a low, timid voice, "'If you please, sir.' The rabbit started violently, dropped the white kid gloves in the fan, and scurried away into the darkness as hard as he could go. Alice took up the fan and gloves, and, as the hall was very hot, she kept fanning herself all the time and went on talking. "'Dear, dear, how queer everything is today. And yesterday things went on it's just as usual.' I wonder if I've been changed in the night. Let me think. I was in the same when I got up this morning? Or was I? I almost think I can remember feeling a little different. But if I'm not the same, the next question is, who in the world am I? I almost think I... Ugh. That's the great puzzle. And she began thinking over all the children she knew that were the same age as herself to see if she could have been changed for any of them. All right, legal, sleep well. Thank you once again for joining. It was delightful to have you. And I really enjoyed what you were able to share with me before stream too. It's been a lovely time. Zegamus, how are you, Zegabean? Oh, unfortunately, I don't have Nightbot set up in here, so I can't give you like the emote style hug, but I'm delighted you've dropped in. <laughs> Hello, thank you for joining us tonight. It's good to have you. <laughs> Oh, you absolute charmer. Um, yeah, we are just doing Alice's Adventures in Wonderland tonight. Oh, and thank you for the follow. Um, so it's been a bit of an odd day, and I figure why not, uh, you know, put my oddity in perspective a little bit. Oh, but I I'm so glad you've managed to join in. Hmm. And so Alice is currently trying to figure out who she might be, if she is not, in fact, Alice. I'm sure I'm not Ada, she said. For her hair goes in such long ringlets, and mine doesn't go in ringlets at all. And I'm sure I can't be Mabel, for I know all sorts of things, and she... Oh, she knows so very little. Besides, she's she, and I'm I, and... Oh dear, how puzzling it all is. I'll try if I know all the things I used to know. Let me see, 4 times 5 is 12, and 4 times 6 is 13, and 4 times 7 is... Oh dear, I shall never get to 20 at that rate. However, the multiplication table doesn't signify. Let's try geography. London is the capital of Paris, and Paris is the capital of Rome, and Rome... No, that's all wrong. I'm certain I must have been changed for Mabel. I'll try and say, how doth the little... And she crossed her hands in the, her lap as if she were saying lessons and began to repeat it. But her voice sounded hoarse and strange, and the words did not come out the same as they used to do. I'm glad to hear you're well, Sega. How doth the little crocodile improve his shining tail and pour the waters of the Nile on every golden scale? How cheerfully he seems to grin, how neatly spread his claws, and welcome little fishes in with gently smiling jaws. I'm sure those are not the right words, said poor Alice, and her eyes filled with tears again as she went on. And it must be Mabel after all, and I shall have to go and live in that pokey little house, and have next to no toys to play with, and oh, ever so many lessons to learn. No, I've made up my mind about it. If I'm Mabel, I'll stay down here. It'll be no use there putting their heads up down and saying, Come up again, dear. I shall only look up and say, Who am I then? Tell me that first, and then if I like being that person, I'll come up. If not, I'll stay down here till I'm somebody else. Oh, dear, cried Alice with a sudden burst of tears. 
I would love it if they would put their heads down. I am so very tired of being all alone down here. Legal, you are correct. Kefri is absolutely adorable. Thank you for reminding us all. As she said this, she looked down at her hands and was a little surprised to see that she had put one of the rabbit's little white kid gloves on while she was talking. How can I have done that? She thought. I must be growing small again. She got up and went to the table to measure herself by it and found that, as nearly as she could guess, she was now about two feet high and was going on shrinking rapidly. She soon found out that the cause of this was the fan she was holding, and she dropped it hastily just in time to avoid shrinking away altogether. Hmm, Legal's putting Zegamus in the cute box? Let me see if I have a cute box that I can pull out here. Probably have one somewhere. I am not sure how to make this bigger. It's a little bit of a small cute box. Uh, no, that rotates. Um, oh, there we go. Yes, a nice big cute box. Um, I don't, however, have a Zegamus. Which, you know, is always disappointing. But, um, okay. So, we will have to do a cute box some other time, I'm afraid. Legal, if you put all of my friends in the cute box, it'll overflow. We'll have to have multiple cute boxes at that point. <laughs> oh dear. But I shall have to talk to Segamus and Kefri and see if either of them are amenable to being put in a cute box. I also need to update the cute box so it's a little bit less uh, scuffed, I suppose one might say, but... Uh... All right, Celine goes in the cute box. I I can live with this. Let's uh. There we are. I'm I'm, okay. <laughs> Much better. <laughs> oh heck, uh, that was awkward for a moment there. But uh. Oh, Caffrey, you're too cool to join me in the cute box. Well, that's all right. Um, well, the cute box is what you put cuties in, B. Um, Legal has been putting people in the cute box for a hot minute now, and I got to the point where I just wanted to make sure there was a cute box for people to be put in. So, uh, now there is a box that is cute, and it is good for putting cute people in. Um... But I do think it needs just a little bit of a tweak. Let me see if I can uh, get that taken care of here real quick. <laughs> uh... Oh, Legal says that Kefri goes in the cool box? We don't have a cool box yet. We shall have to make one. Well, Legal, once we get around to it, I'm sure it'll be lovely to put a cool box out so that we can, you know, use it. Uh, let's see here. So I am just searching for my cute box real quick. Uh, if it goes in... Downloads? Hmm. Having a little trouble opening it. There's downloads. There's my cute box. And we'll simply crop the image down here. And it occurs to me you can't necessarily see what I'm doing. Let me uh, fix that too. <laughs> the 
Legal is getting ready to start a box factory? I don't hate this idea. Alright, so there, we've cropped the cute box down. Let's uh, export it. Back to cute box. Place the existing one. Alright. So there's that handled. Get rid of that cute box and add in the new one. There we are. A nice big cute box capable of containing people. <laughs> and there we have it. Legal Box Incorporated. That's certainly a choice. Oh, Dryad, Elise, thank you so much for following. I'm sorry I uh, got distracted by a cute box here. Um, <laughs> but I'm delighted to have you both with me here. Thank you for dropping in. It's very good to see you. We are just reading Alice's Adventures in Wonderland tonight, and uh, Legal here has a tendency to uh, put people in the cute box, so now there is a cute box. If any of you need the cute box, please let me know. I'm happy to share it. It's uh, meant to be a cute box for everybody. Um, and that's very true, Legal. Elise is adorable. And Dryad... I don't think I've had enough of a time to spend with Dryad, but, uh, you know, if there's somebody that Elise enjoys spending time with as much as she does, I see no reason to expect that Dryad is anything less than quite impressive. So, there's that. Um, <laughs> but yes, I think I'll be turning the cute box back off for a little bit here. Um, if I get to the point where I have redeems, we'll make the cute box one of the redeems. Very lovely partner, yes, at least. <laughs> All right, so Alice, for her part, has just found out that waving a fan at herself makes her significantly smaller, and she is now wearing a rabbit's stolen gloves. That was a narrow escape, said Alice, a good deal frightened at the sudden change, but very glad to find herself still in existence. And now for the garden. And she ran with all speed back to the little door, but alas, the little door was shut again, and the little golden key was lying on the glass table as before. And things are worse than ever, thought the poor child, for I was never so small as this before, never, and I declare it's too bad, that it is. <laughs> Hello, a dream sanguine. Lovely to have you with us here, and thank you for the follow. <laughs> Summoned by Elise, the Bean Queen. I see. Well, I'm delighted that you dropped in, and it's good to have you with us. Uh, we are just doing Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, and Alice has a small problem, which is to say she is very small at the moment. As she said these words, her foot slipped, and in another moment, splash, she was up to her chin in salt water. Her first idea was that she had somehow fallen into the sea, and in that case, I can go back by railway, she said to herself. Alice had been to the seaside once in her life, and had come to the general conclusion that whenever you went to the English coast, you can find a number of bathing machines in the sea, some children digging for sa in the sand with wooden spades, then a row of lodging houses, and behind them a railway station. However, she was soon made out that she was in the pool of tears which she had wept when she was nine feet high. Oh, if only I hadn't cried so much, said Alice as she swam about, trying to find her way out. I shall be punished for it now, I suppose, by being drowned in my own tears. That will be a queer thing, to be sure. However, everything is queer today. I mean, if you're gay enough, everything is queer every day. 
but happy Pride Month. Just then, she heard something splashing about in the pool a little way off, and she swam nearer to make out what it was. At first, she thought it must be a walrus or hippopotamus, but then she remembered how small she was now, and she soon made it out that it was only a mouse that had slipped in like herself. Would it be of any use now to speak to this mouse? Everything is so out of the way down here that I should think very likely it can talk. At any rate, there's no harm in trying. So she began. Oh, mouse, do you know the way out of this pool? I am very tired of swimming about here, oh, mouse. Alice thought this must be the right way of speaking to a mouse. She had never done such a thing before, but she remembered having seen in her brother's Latin grammar a mouse... Of a mouse, to a mouse, a mouse, oh mouse. The mouse looked at her rather inquisitively and seemed to think wink with one of its little eyes, but it said nothing. Perhaps it doesn't understand English, thought Alice. I dare say it's a French mouse. Come over with William the Conqueror. For with all her knowledge of history, Alice had no very clear notion how long ago anything had happened. So she began again, Où est ma chat? which is the first sentence in her French lesson book. The mouse gave a sudden leap out of the water and seemed to quiver all over with fright. Oh, I beg your pardon, cried Alice hastily, afraid that she had hurt the poor animal's feelings. I quite forgot that you didn't like cats. Not like cats, cried the mouse in a shrill, passionate voice. Would you like cats if you were me? Well, perhaps not. Don't be angry about it. And yet I'd love to show you our cat, Dinah. I think you'd take a fancy to cats if only you could see her. She is such a dear, quiet thing. Alice went on, half to herself, as she swam lazily about in the pool. And she sits purring so nicely by the fire, licking her paws and washing her face. And she's such a nice, soft thing to nurse. And she's such a capital one for catching mice. Oh, I beg your pardon, cried Alice. And again, for this time, the mouse was bristling all over. And she felt certain it must really be offended. We won't talk about her anymore, if you'd rather not. We indeed, cried the mouse, who was trembling down to the end of its tail. As if I would talk on such a subject. Our family always hated cats. Nasty, low, vulgar things. Don't let me hear the name again. I won't indeed, said Alice, in a great hurry to change the subject of conversation. Are you, are you fond of, of dogs? The mouse did not answer, so Alice went on eagerly. There's such a nice little dog near our house, I should like to show you a little bright-eyed terrier, you know, with oh such long curly brown hair, and it'll fetch things when you throw them, and it'll sit up and beg for its dinner, and all sorts of things. I can't remember half of them. And it belongs to a farmer, you know, and he says it's so useful, worth a hundred pounds. It kills all the rats and... Uh, oh dear, cried Alice in a sorrowful tone. I'm afraid I've offended it again. For the mouse was swimming away from her as hard as it could go and making quite a commotion in the pool as it went. So she called softly after it. Mouse, dear, do come back again. We won't talk about cats or dogs either if you don't like them. When the mouse heard this, it turned round and swam slowly back to her. Its face was quite pale. With passion, Alice thought, and it said in a low, trembling voice, Let us get to the shore. Then I'll tell you my history and you'll understand why it is I hate cats and dogs. It was high time to go, for the pool was getting quite crowded with birds and animals that had fallen into it. There was a duck and a dodo and a lorry and an eaglet and several other curious creatures. Alice led the way and the whole party swam to the shore. Well, that was quite the eventful chapter. Yes, Kefri, the dodo plays a rather significant role in all of this now. 
but perhaps I shouldn't be spoiling the story that I'm about to read. <laughs> I am going to take just a moment to uh, get a couple of drinks in here, though. As much as I enjoy these higher voices, some of them can be a little bit drying on my throat, so I have to be a bit careful there. Uh-oh. I seem to have come to the end of my glass of water. Mm. Not that I, you know, prepared an entire gallon of the stuff in order to do a stream tonight, but ah, it'll be fine. Mm. So, how is everybody doing in chat? You know, it's not the tastiest tap water, but it's certainly a lot more drinkable than Arizona's was. So, I'm satisfied with my hydration. All right. Chapter three, a caucus race and a long tail. They were indeed a queer looking party that assembled on the bank. The birds with draggled feathers, the animals with their fur clinging close to them, all dripping wet, cross, and uncomfortable. The first question, of course. Tap water? Uh, yes, Kefri. So, in many places that I've lived, it's not a particularly good idea to drink water directly from the faucets inside of a house. However, the place that I'm currently living has some pretty solid water quality. Um... You know, that it's it just happened to be in a place that cares about having drinkable water. Um, and I appreciate that. It, it's uh, I don't know if there are any people who work on municipal water boards, but having water that does not cause you to vomit or have severe diarrhea after drinking three or four glasses of the stuff is actually a very helpful thing. Um, not only does it help people like me who do voice work to have a ready access, uh, accessible supply of water, it also helps with some of the other animals in the environment. Um, I know when I was living in Arizona, uh, one of the people I was living with had a dog. And, uh, you know, we didn't think too much of putting tap water out for the dog because it was a dog. Uh, we didn't expect the taste would much matter. Hello, Lucy. Thank you for the poi. Uh, but what we found was that within a couple of days, the dog was having some serious bowel issues. <laughs> Hello, Lucy. Thank you for the warm greeting. And so uh, once we switched over to using some uh, like properly purified water, things went quite smoothly. But it also meant that we were spending significantly more in order to provide a gallon of water for the dog. Uh, it was unfortunate, and it meant that we had to have a degree of, uh, you know, care for actually picking it up. Anyway, so with that said, uh, I think I'm going to take one more drink here. Good stuff. <laughs> Always give pets the best food and water. Um, I can generally agree with that. Especially since the poor things don't get much choice in the matter. Uh, your, your pet typically does not have the ability to complain that you have provided it with inferior food. Unless it's a cat, since we all know cats will say things like, Oh, mother, you have provided me with inadequate food. You must not love me. I am terribly bereft because of this poor quality of food. How could you provide me with mints, mother? I am disappointed. In fact, I think I shall run away. And you shall never see me again. Ooh, belly pats. Mm, thank you. 
you know, as cats are wont to do. <laughs> Hydrate for 200 channel points. I didn't know I had channel points, but all right. <laughs> mm. <laughs> Hydration complete. Thank you, Capri. <laughs> The first question, of course, was how to get dry again. They had a consultation about this, and after a few minutes, it seemed quite natural to Alice to find herself talking familiarly with them, as if she had known them all her life. Indeed, she had quite a long argument with the lorry, who at last turned sulky and would only say, I am older than you and must know better. And this Alice would not allow without knowing how old it was. And, as the lorry positively refused to tell its age, there was no more to be said. What is a poyo? I know what a puyo is, but I'm not familiar with poyo. Poyo poyo. Oh, it's something that Kirby says. Poyo! 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 I don't know. It's probably something like that. At last, the mouse, who seemed to be a person of authority among them, called out, Sit down, all of you, and listen to me! I'll soon make you dry enough! They all sat down at once, in a large ring with the mouse in the middle. Alice kept her eyes anxiously fixed on it, for she felt sure she would catch a bad cold if she did not get dry very soon. Oh, it's from a specific YouTube series, not the actual games. Okay. I, I figured it was actually from the television series, um, since, you know, the... I, I haven't seen nearly as much of that series as I would like, but... Let's be honest, I don't really take the time to sit down and watch television much, so uh, I spend more time reading, interestingly. <laughs> hmm. Ahem, said the mouse with an important air. Are you all ready? This is the driest thing I know. Silence all around, if you please. William the Conqueror, whose cause was favoured by the Pope, was soon submitted by the English, who wanted leaders, and had been of late much accustomed to usurpation and conquest. Edward and Morcar, the Earls of Mercia and Northumbria. Ugh, said the lorry with a shiver. I beg your pardon, said the mouse, frowning, but very politely. Did you speak? Not I, said the lorry hastily. I thought you did. I proceed. Edwin and Morgar, the Earls of Mercia and Northumbria, declared for him and even Stigand, the patriotic Archbishop of Canterbury, found it advisable. Found what? said the duck. Found it, said the mouse rather crossly. Of course you know what it means. I know what it means well enough when I find a thing. It's generally a frog or a worm. The question is, what did the Archbishop find? Celine doesn't watch telly, but I'm too busy reading and or knitting. Okay, let's be clear. I haven't done knitting or crochet in a hot minute. Um, sadly, actually. I think the last thing I was working on was actually like a... um. A little toy of a certain streamer, but I'm not going to give any further details on that, sorry. Uh, but no, unfortunately it's been several months since I've been able to pick up my hooks. Um, and that's just a matter of not having properly unpacked. Um, I'll get there eventually, when I'm, you know, focused on other things than streaming and spending time reading things and learning new stories and making models and Okay, I might have a little bit going on these days, but that doesn't excuse me from my crochet. It does, however, excuse me from television. 
The mouse did not notice this question, but hurriedly went on. Found it advisable to go with Edgar Atherton to meet William and offer the crown. William's conduct at first was moderate, but the insolence of his Normans... How are you getting on now, my dear? It continued, turning to Alice as it spoke. As wet as ever, said Alice in a melancholy tone. It doesn't seem to dry me at all. In that case, said the dodo solemnly, rising to its feet, I move that the meeting adjourn for the immediate adoption of more energetic recipes. Grandma confirmed? <laughs> All right, Caffrey, if you need to see me as a grandmother, I'm not going to argue the point with you. <laughs> oh, quite the kitty. Speak English, said the eaglet. I don't know the meaning of half those words, and what's more, I don't believe you do either. And the eaglet bent down its head to hide a smile. Some of the other birds tittled audibly. What I was going to say, said the dodo in an offended tone, was that the best thing for us to get dry would be a caucus race. What is a caucus race? said Alice. Not that she much wanted to know, but the dodo had paused as if it thought that somebody ought to speak, and no one else seemed inclined to say anything. Why? said the dodo. The best way to explain it is to do it. And as you might like to try the thing yourself, some winter day I will tell you how the dodo managed it. First, it marked out a race course in a sort of circle. Exact shape doesn't matter, it said. And then all the party were placed along the course here and there. There was no one, two, three, and away, but they began running when they liked and let off when they liked, so that it was not easy to know when the race was over. However, when they had been running half an hour or so and were quite dry again, the dodo suddenly called out, The race is over! And they all crowded around it, panting and asking, but who has won? This question the dodo could not answer without a great deal of thought, and it sat for a long time with one finger pressed upon its forehead, the position you usually see Shakespeare in the pictures of him. There are pictures of Shakespeare? While the rest waited in silence, at last the dodo said, Everybody has won, and all must have prizes. But who is to give the prizes? Quite a chorus of voices asked. Uh, why, she, of course. The dodo pointed at Alice with one finger, and the whole party at once crowded round her, calling out in a confused way, Prizes! Prizes! Alice had no idea what to do, and in despair she put her hand in her pocket and pulled out a box of confites. Luckily, the salt water had not gotten into them and handed them around as prizes. There was exactly one apiece all around. But she must have a prize herself, you know, said the mouse. Of course, said the dodo gravely. What else have you got in your pocket? He went on, turning to Alice. Only a thimble, Alice said sadly. Well, hand it over here. Then they all crowded round her once more while the dodo solemnly presented the thimble, saying, We beg your acceptance of this elegant thimble. And when it had finished this short speech, they all cheered. Alice thought the whole thing very absurd, but they all looked so grave she did not dare to laugh. And as she could not think of anything to say, she simply bowed and took the thimble, looking as solemn as she could. How does one look solemn? Well, I... I don't know why I've asked a question that I can't answer. But... I suppose it's something that people do sometimes. <laughs> uh, or at least if Lewis Carroll is to be believed. The next thing was to eat the confites. 
This caused some noise and confusion, as the large birds complained that they could not taste theirs and the small ones choked and had to be patted on the back. However, it was over at last and they sat down again in a ring and begged the mouse to tell them something more. You promised to tell me your history, you know, said Alice. And why you hate, um, C and D, she added in a whisper, half afraid that she, it would be offended again. Mine is a long and sad tale, said the mouse, turning to Alice and sighing. Oh, it is. It is a long tail, certainly, said Alice, looking down with wonder at the mouse's tail. But why do you call it sad? And she kept on puzzling about it while the mouse was speaking, so that her idea of the tail was something like this. Fury said to the mouse that he met in the house, let us both go to law, I will prosecute you! Come, I'll take no denial, we must have a trial, for really this morning I've nothing to do. Said the mouse to the cur, such a trial, dear sir, with no jury or judge would be wasting our breath. I'll be the judge and I'll be the jury, said cunning old fury. I'll try the whole cause and condemn you to death. You are not attending, said the mouse to Alice severely. What are you thinking of? I beg your pardon, said Alice very humbly. You had got the fifth bend, I think? I had not, cried the mouse sharply and angrily. A knot, said Alice, always ready to make herself useful and looking anxiously about her. Oh, do help me, uh, do let me help undo it. I shall do nothing of this sort, said the mouse, getting up and walking away. You insult me by talking such nonsense. I didn't mean it, pleaded poor Alice. But you're so easily offended, you know. The mouse only growled in reply. Please come back and finish your story. Alice called after it, and others joined in the chorus. Yes, please do. Please do. But the mouse only shook its head impatiently and walked a little quicker. What a pity it wouldn't stay, said the lorry as soon as the, it was quite out of sight. And an old crab took the opportunity of saying to her daughter, Oh, my dear, let this be a lesson to you never to lose your temper. Hold your tongue, ma, said the young crab a little snappishly. You're enough to try the patience of an oyster. Oh, if only I had Dinah here, I know what she'd do. She'd soon fetch it back. And who's Dinah, if I might venture the question, said the lorry. Alice replied eagerly, for she was always ready to talk about her pet. Dinah's our cat, and she's a capital one for catching mice. You can't think, oh, and if only you could see her after the birds. I should eat a little bird as soon as look at it. This speech caused a remarkable sensation among the party. Some of the birds hurried off at once. One old magpie began wrapping itself up very carefully, remarking, I really must be getting home, the night air doesn't suit my throat. And the canary called out in trembling voice to her children, Come away, my dears, it's high time we were all in bed. On various pretexts, they all moved off and Alice was soon left alone. Oh, if only I hadn't mentioned Dinah. She said to herself in a melancholy tone, Nobody seems to like her down here, and I'm sure she's the best cat in the world. Oh, my dear Dinah, I wonder if I shall ever see you cry any more. And here poor Alice began to cry again, for she felt very lonely and low spirited. In a little while, however, she heard a little pattering of footsteps in the distance and looked up eagerly, hoping that the mouse had changed his mind and was coming back. To finish his story. Ah. <laughs> Oof. Well, we've reached the end of chapter three. How is everyone in chat doing?
Caffrey is awake, which is more than I can probably say about several people. And far more than I should say about anyone. Talking about others is probably not appropriate. But, you know, one does it from time to time. If one is silly, and I am, in fact, quite silly, perhaps. <laughs> You've seen a few movies based on this, but never read the book. Well, that doesn't surprise me. Um, so I guess a little bit about my own personal history with this book. Um, my parents often would read longer stories when we were on road trips. Um, which road trips were a fairly frequent thing. Every few months or so, we would all pile into the car and drive somewhere several days away. And on the way, mother would read from a book. And quite often the book would be something uh, fairly simple that all of us were interested in. Um, but one weekend we went up to a cottage. Oh, uh, lurking. Well, thank you for lurking, Caffrey. I appreciate you being around, even if you're not necessarily listening and paying attention. That's that's totally fine. Um, but what we found was that uh, one day we were up at a cabin, and my mother, being the reader that she was, uh, decided to read a compilation that she had of both Alice's Adventures in Wonderland and the sequel Through the Looking Glass and what Alice found there. Um, now, as it turns out, both books are significantly longer than the tiny paperback had led her to believe. So we didn't finish it. Um, or if we did, I fell asleep long before we reached anything resembling the climax. So, um, I don't necessarily have as much familiarity with the book as I would necessarily have liked. Um, it's also one that I've considered reading for my son, but again, knowing the length of it, I wasn't at all certain that uh, that'd be something he would be interested in sticking around for on a given night. Um, as things stand, we are, hmm, I would say roughly a fifth of the way through the story. Um, not necessarily accounting for any back matter or things of that nature. So, uh, we, we've got quite a ways to go and a bit over an hour to do it in. So, I suppose we'll just kind of keep at it then. Um, but if I drink too much water all at once, it tends to not feel very good. So, I'm going to crack open a drink that I know Small is quite fond of and familiar with. I have a spare Pepsi. So, yes, I'll, I'll be drinking this now. Satisfactory. Chapter 4. The Rabbit Sends In a Little Bill. It was the right rabbit, trotting slowly back and looking anxiously about as it went, as if it had lost something. And she heard it muttering to itself, Oh, Duchess, the Duchess, oh, my dear paws, oh, my furs and whiskers, she'll get me executed as sure as ferrets are ferrets. Where can I have dropped them, I wonder? Alice guessed in the moment that it was looking for the fan and pair of white kid gloves, and she very good-naturedly began hunting about for them, but they were nowhere to be seen. Everything seemed to have changed since her swim in the pool, and the great hall with the glass table and little door had vanished completely. Very soon, the rabbit noticed Alice and went hunting about and called out to her in an angry tone, Why, Mary Ann, what are you doing out here? Run home this moment and fetch me a pair of gloves and a fan, quick now! And Alice was so much frightened that she took off at once in the direction it had pointed, without trying to explain the mistake it had made. He took me for a housemaid, she said to herself as she ran. How surprised he'll be when he finds out who I am, but I'd better take him his fan and gloves, that is, if I can find them. As she said this, she came upon a neat little house, on the door of which was engraved a bright brass plate with the name W. Rabbit engraved upon it. 
She went in without knocking and hurried upstairs in fear lest she meet the real Marianne and be turned out of the house before she had found the fan and gloves. How queer it seems, Alice said to herself, to be going messages for a rabbit. I suppose Dinah will be sending me on messages next. And she began fancying herself the sort of thing that would happen. Miss Alice, come here directly and get ready for your walk. Coming in a minute, Miss. But I've got to see that the mouse doesn't get out. Only, I don't think that they'd let Dinah stop in the house if it began ordering people about like that. By this time, she had found her way into the tidy little room with a table in the window, and on it, as she had hoped, a fan and two or three pairs of tiny white kid gloves. She took up the fan and a pair of the gloves and was about to leave the room when her eye fell upon a little bottle that stood near the looking glass. There was no label this time with the words, Drink Me, but nevertheless she uncorked it and put it to her lips. I know something interesting is sure to happen. Whenever I eat or drink anything, so I'll just see what this bottle does. I do hope it'll make me grow large again, for I'm quite tired of being such a tiny little thing. It did so indeed, and much sooner than she had expected. Before she had drunk half the bottle, she found her head pressing against the ceiling and had to stoop to save her neck from being broken. She hastily put down the bottle, saying to herself, "'That's quite enough. I hope I shan't grow any more. "'As it is, I can't get out the door. "'Oh, if only I hadn't drunk quite so much!' Alas, it was too late. She went on growing and growing and very soon had to kneel down on the floor. In another minute there was not even room for this, and she tried the effect of lying down with one elbow against the door and the other arm curled around her head. Still, she went on growing, and as a last resource she put one arm out of the window and one foot up the chimney and said to herself, "'No, what more can I do? Oh, whatever happens, what will become of me?' Um, oh, I lost my place for a moment there, but I think we got it back. Luckily for Alice, the little magic bottle had now had its full effect, and she grew no larger. Still, it was very uncomfortable, and as there seemed to be no sort of chance of her ever getting out of the room again, no wonder she felt unhappy. It was much pleasanter at home, thought poor Alice, when one wasn't always growing larger and smaller and being ordered about by mice and rabbits. If only I hadn't gone down that rabbit hole, and yet... And yet... It's rather curious, you know, this sort of life. Oh, I do wonder what can have happened to me. When I used to read fairy tales, I fancied that kind of thing never happened, and now here I am in the middle of one. There ought to be a book written about me. That there ought. And when I grow up, I'll write one. But I'm grown up now, she added in a sorrowful tone. At least there's no room to grow up any more here. But then, shall I never get any older than I am now? And it'll be a comfort one way, never to be an old woman. Ouch, Alice, dang! Stay thy tongue, a wicked beast! <laughs> But then, always to have lessons to learn. Oh, I shouldn't like that. Oh, you foolish Alice, she answered herself. How can you learn lessons in here Why, there's hardly any room for you and no room for at all for any lesson books? And so she went on, talking first one side and then the other, and making quite a conversation of it altogether. But after a few minutes, she heard a voice outside and stopped to listen. Mary Anne! Mary Anne! said the voice. Fetch me my gloves this moment. Then came a little pattering of feet on the stairs. Alice knew it was the rabbit coming to look for her, and she trembled till she shook the house, quite forgetting that it was now a thousand times, uh, she was now a thousand times as large as the rabbit and had no reason to be afraid of it. Presently, the rabbit came up to the door and tried to open it, but as the door opened inwards, Alice's elbow was pressed hard against it. That attempt proved a failure. Alice heard it say to itself, oh, 
and then I'll go around and get in the window. And that you won't, thought Alice. And after waiting till she fancied she heard the rabbit just under the window, she suddenly spread out her hand and made to snatch in the air. She did not get a hold of anything, but heard a little shriek and a fall and a crash of broken glass from which she concluded that if it was possible, it had fallen into a cucumber frame or something of the sort. Next came an angry voice, the rabbit's, Pat! Pat, where are you? And then a voice she had never heard before. Sure, then I'm here. Digging for apples, your honor. Digging for apples, indeed. Here, come help me out of this. And the sounds of more were broken glass. Now tell me, Pat, what is in that window? Uh, sure, it's an arm, your honor. He pronounced it arm. An arm, you goose. Whoever saw that one, one that size, why it fits the whole room? Sure it does, your honor, but there's an arm for all that. Well, it's got no business in there at any rate. Go and take it away. There was a long silence after this, and Alice could only hear whispers now and then, such as, Sure, I don't like it, your honor, at all, at all. And, do as I tell you, coward. And at last she spread out her hand again and made another snatch in the air. This time there were two little shrieks and more sounds of broken glass. What a number of cucumber frames there must be, thought Alice. I wonder what they'll do next. As for pulling me out of the window, if only they could. I'm sure I don't want to stay here any longer. She waited for some time without hearing anything more, and at last came a rumbling of little cartwheels and the sound of a good many voices all talking together. She made out the words, Where's your little ladder? Well, I haven't had but one bit. Bill's got the other. Bill, fetch it here, lad. Here, put him up in this corner. No, tie him together first. They don't reach half enough yet. Oh, they do well enough, don't be particular. Here, Bill, come catch hold of this rope. Will the roof bear? Mind that loose slate. Oh, it's coming down. Heads up below. A loud crash. Now, who did that? It was Bill, I fancy. You just go down the chimney. Nay, I shan't. You do it. Hmm. That I won't, then. Bill's to go down there. Here, Bill. The master says you're to go down the chimney. Oh, so Bill's got to come down the chimney, has he? said Alice to herself. Shy, they seem to put everything upon poor Bill. I wouldn't be in Bill's place for a good deal. The fireplace is narrow, to be sure, but I think I can kick a little. She drew her foot as far down in the chimney as she could, and waited till she heard a little animal, she couldn't guess of what sort it was, scratching and scrambling about in the chimney close above her, then saying to herself, This is Bill. She gave a sharp kick and waited to see what would happen next. The first thing she heard was a chorus of, There goes Bill! Then the rabbit's voice, Catch him, you, by the hedge! Then silence, and then another confusion of voices. All is that a brandy now? Don't choke him. How was it, old fellow? What happened to you? Tell us all about it. Last came a little feeble squeaking voice. And that's Bill, thought Alice. Well, I hardly know. More than... Oh, no more, thank you. I'm better now. I'm a deal too flustered to tell you. All I know is something comes at me like a jack-in-the-box and up it goes like a skyrocket. So you did, old fellow, said the others. We must burn down the house, said the rabbit's voice. And Alice called out as loud as she could, If you do, I'll set Dinah at you. There was dead silence instantly, and Alice thought to herself, I wonder what they will do next. If they had any sense, they'd take the roof off. After a minute or two, they began moving about again, and Alice heard the rabbit say, A bowful will do to begin with. A bowful of what? thought Alice. But she had not long to doubt, for the next moment a shower of little pebbles came rattling in the w at the window, and some of them hit her in the face. I'll put a stop to this, 
she said to herself and shouted out, You better not do that again! Which produced another dead silence. Alice noticed with some surprise that the pebbles were all turning into little cakes as they lay on the floor, and a bright idea came to her head. If I eat one of these cakes, she thought, it's sure to make some change in my size, and as it can't possibly make me larger, it must make me smaller, I suppose. So she swallowed one of the cakes and was delighted to find that it began shrinking directly. As soon as she was small enough to get out through the door, she ran out of the house and found quite a crowd of animals and birds waiting outside. The poor little lizard, Bill, who was in the middle of being held up by two guinea pigs, who were giving it something out of a bottle. They all made a rush at Alice the moment she appeared, but she ran off as hard as she could and soon found herself safe in a thick wood. The first thing I've got to do, said Alice to herself as she wandered about in the wood, is to grow to my right size again, and the second thing is to find my way into that lovely garden. I think that will be the best plan. It sounded like an excellent plan, no doubt, and very neatly and simply arranged. The only difficulty was that she had not the smallest idea how to set about it. And while she was peering about anxiously amongst the trees, a little sharp bark just over her head made her look up in a great hurry. Excuse me. An enormous puppy was looking down at her with large round eyes and feebly stretching out one paw trying to touch her. Poor little thing, said Alex in a co Alice in a coaxing Poor little thing, said Alice in a coaxing tone, and she tried hard to whistle to it, but she was terribly frightened all the time and thought she it might be hungry, in which case it would be very likely to eat her up in spite of all her coaxing. Hardly knowing what she did, she picked up a little bit of stick and held it out to the puppy, whereupon the puppy jumped into the air on all its feet at once, and with a yelp of delight rushed at the stick and made believe to worry it. Then Alice dodged behind a great thistle to keep herself from being run over, and the moment she appeared on the other side, the puppy made another rush at the stick and tumbled head over heels in its hurry to get a hold of it. Then Alice, thinking it was very like having a game of play with a cart horse, and expecting every moment to be trampled under its feet, ran round the thistle again. Then the puppy began a series of short charges at the stick, running a very little way forward each time and a long way back, and barking hoarsely all the while, till at last it sat down a good way off, panting, with its tongue hanging out of its mouth and its great eyes half shut. This seemed to Alice a good opportunity for making her escape, so she set off at once and ran till she was quite tired and out of breath, until the puppy's bark sounded quite faint in the distance. "'And yet what a dear little puppy it was,' said Alice as she leaned against a buttercup to rest herself and fanned herself with one of the leaves. "'I should have liked to teaching it tricks very much, if, if I had only been the right size to do it. Oh dear, I'd nearly forgotten that I'd have been got to grow up again. Oh, let me see, how is it managed? I suppose I ought to eat or drink something or other, but the great question is, what? The great question certainly was what. Alice looked all around her at the flowers and the blades of grass, but she did not see anything that looked like the right thing to eat or drink under the circumstances. There was a large mushroom growing near her about the same height as herself, and when she had looked under it on both sides of it and behind it, it occurred to her that she might as well look and see what was on top of it. She stretched herself up on tiptoe and peeped over the edge of the mushroom, and her eyes immediately met those of a large blue caterpillar that was sitting on top with its arms folded, quietly smoking a long hookah, and taking not the smallest notice of her or anything. So the next chapter will be advice for a caterpillar. Let's see here. And quite a fun thing, I suspect it would be. Uh, 
but I think I will take just a moment there to catch my breath. It's uh, it's been certainly a few uh, little chapters here, and oh boy! But all the same, thank you everybody who is still with me here. I appreciate everyone who's come in tonight. It's uh. I know it's been a bit of a thing, but I always like people who are willing to spend time with me. And this story is one that I've been looking to read for several days now, so I'm glad to get a chance to properly do so. Um, I still need to decide where exactly I'll uh, upload the video once this is finished, and it'll probably need a little bit of editing, um, just knowing myself. Uh, how I handle stuff, it's, uh, it's gonna take a hot minute to do. Um, but I will probably end up putting this on my YouTube channel, uh, editing out some of the moments that are a bit more audience interaction oriented. Um, but, uh, with that said, let's see, we are at chapter five. How many chapters are meant to be in this story? Five out of twelve, so we are just under halfway there. And there is chapter five. I think actually I may need just a moment here. Um, Alright, uh, my apologies, but I will need just a few seconds here, so, uh, I'll be right back. Alright, thank you everyone for your patience. Kefri, welcome back. It's good to see you here. Um, and yeah, my apologies there. Um, but I think I am just about ready to resume with chapter 5, wherein we have advice from a caterpillar. 
The caterpillar and Alice looked at each other for some time in silence. At last, the caterpillar took the hookah out of its mouth and addressed her in a languid, sleepy voice. Who are you? This was not an encouraging opening for a conversation. Alice replied rather shyly, I, I hardly know, sir, just at present. At least, I know who I was when I got up this morning, but I think I must have changed several times since then. What do you mean by that? Explain yourself. I can't explain myself, I'm afraid, sir, because I'm not myself, you see. I don't see. I'm afraid I can't put it more clearly, Alice replied very politely, for I can't understand it myself to begin with, and being so many different sizes in a day is very confusing. Neko! Oh my goodness, thank you for the raids! I really appreciate you dropping in! Oh my, arm on Twitch and Paw, good to see both of you. And hello, pretty kitty. Ah, it's wonderful to see you here. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, how was the overwatching? All right. Everybody who, uh, Neko is one of my oldest friends, uh, through Twitch and VR chat. Um, and so she, uh, plays Overwatch fairly often lately. Um, she does VR chat from time to time. Fun and frustrating at the same time? That sounds about right. Overwatch. Overwatch? Overwatch. Overwatch! <laughs> Quite cute, Pa. Ah, oh, thank you so much. Seek, it's good to see you. <laughs> well and not so well in Overwatch, huh? Ooh, woo watch. Ooh, woo? Ooh, woo watch. Ooh, watch. <laughs> you people in these abilities to do voices. What do you mean by you people? Wow. <laughs> I'm, so I suppose for people who aren't familiar with me, my name is Celine Heidelman. I'm a voice actress and a frequent collaborator with both Neko Kitty and uh, her friends Easily Bored. Um, and I often will also do voice work with uh, Road to Dusk, um, particularly for visual novels and uh, old school RPGs. Um, you want my vocals? No, no, no. Don't take my voices. Find your own. They'll suit you much better than anything that I could give you. But honestly, voices are one of those things that just take work. Um, my mother, when I was younger, used to say, if you don't like the voice God gave you, give it right back to him. And while that certainly is uh, one way to phrase it, it's not incorrect. <laughs> uh, Pa, yes, you are always welcome to borrow my voices. Um, just DM me what you'd like me to say and we'll go from there. Uh, <laughs> I, I can't speak for what other VTubers are like, but, uh, yeah, it, it's so, um, <laughs> yes, I do a variety of voices. Tonight we are reading Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. Uh, we have just gotten to a caterpillar with a giant hookah. <laughs> and thank you. I I'm glad to hear that my talents are something that you enjoy. Um, so I hope you all settle in. Yep, uh, Neko, thank you for the lurk. Um, and thank you so much for raiding in. Snacks in a blanket sound amazing. I I need a blanket propped up on it. <laughs> Sometimes it's just nice to be cozy. But yes, uh, so yeah, everybody, if you get a chance, do follow Neko. She's quite fun. She does a good job engaging with her community. And she is sassy to a fault. Um, so it can be quite fun to see what she comes up with in a given night. <laughs> oh, thank you, Neko. <laughs> mm. 
Um, as far as uh, voices go, I, I think probably the first place I recommend is approach it like a three to five year old would. If you find a noise that's funny or weird that you can make, make it over and over and over again until you get sick of it, until everyone around you is sick of it. Because what you'll learn from that is how to hold your mouth, how to hold your throat, how to pass air through your nose. Um, so you can actually do a lot of really cool tricks just by playing with how your voice sounds. Um, it might not make sense in the moment, but everything you learn... <laughs> uh... Seek? I... Uh, seek, see if you can phrase that without cursing. Uh, this is not an 18 plus stream, so um, I will ask folks to avoid profanity when they can. Um, but... Yeah. <laughs> Wow, that endurance of using voice. <laughs> well, thank you. Sorry, Seek. Um, <laughs> and thank you for the vote of confidence, Neko. Um, oh, and Arm and Paw, thank you for the follows. I didn't realize that you... <laughs> oh, that's a bummer. Uh, autocorrect is such a pain. No, no, it happens. Um, I, I know autocorrect doesn't like my name. It takes several weeks every time I get a new phone to convince it that my name is Celine, not Selena or uh, Saline is the other common one. And it's like, no, autocorrect, you have offended me and I cannot challenge you to a duel. But please stop. So, yeah, I, I know what autocorrect is like. Don't worry about it. Um, Serena is what autocorrect is doing for you. Yep, I, I got nothing there. I have no idea why Serena, but not Celine. It's not that uncommon of a name! <laughs> Alright. <laughs> I'm not myself, you see. I don't see. I'm afraid I can't put it more clearly, for I can't understand it myself to begin with, and being so many different sizes in a day is very confusing. It isn't. Well, perhaps you haven't found it so yet, but when you have to turn into a chrysalis, you will someday, you know, and then after that into a butterfly, I should think you'll feel a little queer, won't you? Not a bit. Well, perhaps your feelings may be different. All I know is it would feel very queer to me. <laughs> Thank you for training your autocorrect to believe in me, Kefri. <laughs> Oh, and Seek, yes, thank you for adding me to your dictionary so I can exist in your world. I want to be part of your world. I'm, I'm sure that sounds weird with the background music, but still. <laughs> Actually, did I turn the volume? Okay, yes, I did adjust the volume on the background music. All right. <clears throat> Battle of the most acquired individuals, those who want to mass- Oh, no, 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 I'm using the wrong voice for this. Okay, let me see what I can do for your arm. <clears throat> A battle of the most acquired individuals, those that wish to master the arts and tame the beast known as autocorrect, follow a treacherous path. Fair child, one day we will live in enlightenment, and the freedom that beholds our true wealth in language. A blue blue. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
<laughs> Road, hello, welcome in. Oh, thank you for the raid. Wow, two raids in one night. I must have really timed this well. <laughs> Zelda, good to see you. Okay, let's see if I have the ability to shout out again. Uh, the shout out that comes with Twitch uh, has a cooldown of like 15 minutes. Oh, yeah, no, apparently it worked. Um, so for those not familiar with Road, uh, Road to Dusk is also a streamer. Uh, he's been going for a couple of months now. Uh, he and I frequently do collaborations. Uh, he will, uh, he's had me in to read stories as he draws. Uh, Road is a particularly good artist and helped me settle on the design for my avatar here. Um, and in fact, I have a, uh... This is the version that Road drew. Um, I am still in the process of updating my avatar to actually look like the reference that he gave me. Um, and there were some reasons for some of the changes and details there. But uh, this is the kind of artwork that Road does. He is absolutely fantastic. I love his style. He himself is a fantastic person. So if you get a chance to check out Road to Dusk, I strongly encourage you to do so. Um, and thank you so much for the raid tonight, Road. I really appreciate it. Um, can change the timing of the SO. I don't know if I can change the timing of the shout out. Um, so I don't have a uh, Nightbot or uh, anything along those lines in here at this point. Um, this is the second stream I have ever done for myself, so uh, I don't know if I can change the timeout on the shoutouts or not. I hope so. Um, if uh, Seek, if you want to see me after stream, uh, be more than happy to have any guidance that you can offer me there. Um, oh, Neko, yes, I, I will come reach out and grab you once I'm not uh, streaming here. Thank you, I really appreciate it. Um, okay, <clears throat> let's see here. We need another epic voice because Arm is saying a thing. Um, <clears throat> Tarnished by the waves of battle, we will once again conquer forth a bastion of great fortitude to be vanquished upon the lateral in literacy. <laughs> no, I don't blame you. Uh, I, I do not drink anymore, but when I did, uh, I would start speaking in iambic pentameter, of all things. So I would go full on Shakespearean the entire time. Hello, Ren. It's okay. Uh, Ren, glad to have you with us. Um, and so, yeah, uh, how did stream go? I don't think I saw what you were, uh, you were doing, uh, what was it? Um, was it Call to the Lamb tonight, or, uh, what were you up to? <laughs> yes, Naruto, I am still streaming. Uh, plan is to continue for at least another hour or so here. Um, although I might need to cut things short just depending on, uh, when I start getting tired. But it's good to see you, thank you for dropping in. Um, Kingdom Hearts, okay, gotcha. Oh, uh, spending time with the System of Mists while trying to spread word for them. Okay, well, cool. Um, you know, that, that was really good of you. Um, so, anyway, we are still reading Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. Um... And Alice has been talking with a caterpillar about who she is. <laughs> Let's see here. Uh, nope, that is the puppy here. Oh my goodness, I seem to have scrolled somewhere. Oh, that was a mistake. Uh, ba -ba -ba -ba. Autocorrect dictionary and predictions are what attacks seek. I believe it. Sleep is only necessary to those whom energy source is based in time. Well, oddly enough, I have a very time-bound metabolism. Uh, so <laughs> it's not always possible uh, for me to just ignore the passage of time. 
Um. Well, perhaps your feelings may be different. All I know is it would feel very queer to me. You? Who are you? Which brought them back again to the beginning of the conversation. Alice felt a little irritated at the caterpillars making such very short remarks, and she drew herself up with, and said very gravely, I think you ought to tell me who you are first. Why? Here was another puzzling question, and as Alice could not think of any good reason, and as the caterpillars seemed to be in a very unpleasant state of mind, she turned away. Come back, the caterpillar called after her. I've something important to say. This sounded promising, certainly. Alice returned and came back again. Keep your temper. Is that all? said Alice, swallowing down her anger as well as she could. No. Alice thought she might as well wait, as she had nothing else to do, and perhaps after all it might tell her something worth hearing. For some minutes it puffed away without speaking, but at last it unfolded its arms, took the hookah out of its mouth again, and said, So you think you're changed, do you? I'm afraid I am, sir. I can't remember things as I used, and I don't keep the same size for ten minutes together. Can't remember what things? Alright, Zeke, thank you very much for dropping in as long as you did. I appreciate the heck out of you. You're awesome. I'll see you next time, I hope, okay? <laughs> Have a good night. Well, I've tried to say how doth the little busy bee, but it all came different, replied Alice in a melancholy voice. Repeat, you are old, Father William, said the caterpillar. Alice folded her hands and began. You are old, Father William, the young man said, and your hair has become very white, and yet you incessantly stand on your head. Do you think at your age it is right? In my youth, Father William replied to his son, I feared it might injure the brain, but now that I'm perfectly sure I have none, why do it again and again? You are old, said the youth, as I mentioned before, and have grown most uncommonly fat. Yet you turned a black somersault at, in at the door. Pray, what is the reason of that? In my youth, said the sage, as he took up grey locks, I kept all my limbs very supple. By the use of this ointment, one shilling the box, allow me to sell you a couple. <laughs> oh no, the adverts! The adverts have even invaded the old Victorian <laughs> storybooks. <laughs> ah! You are old, said the youth, and your jaws are too weak for anything tougher than suet. Yet you finished the goose with the bones and the beak. Pray, how did you manage to do it? In my youth, said his father, I took to the law and I argued each case with my wife, and the muscular strength which it gave to my jaw has lasted the rest of my life. You are old, said the youth. One would hardly suppose that your eyes were as steady as ever, yet you balanced an eel on the end of your nose. What made you so awfully clever? I have answered three questions, and that is enough, said his father. Don't give me yourself airs. Do you think I can listen all day to such stuff? Be off, or I'll kick you downstairs. That is not right, said the caterpillar. Not quite right, I'm afraid. Some of the words have got altered. It is wrong from beginning to end, said the caterpillar decidedly, and there was silence for some minutes. The caterpillar was the first to speak. What size do you want to be? Oh, I'm not particular as to size. Only one doesn't like changing so often, you know. I don't know. 
Alice said nothing. She had never been so much contradicted in her life before, and she felt that she was losing her temper. Are you content now? Well, I should like to be a little larger, sir, if you wouldn't mind. Three inches is such a wretched height to be. It is a very good height indeed, said the caterpillar, angrily rearing itself up as it spoke, for it was exactly three inches high. But I'm not used to it, pleaded poor Alice in a piteous tone, and she thought of herself. Oh, if only these creatures weren't so easily offended. You'll get used to it in time said the caterpillar, and it put the hookah into its mouth and began smoking again. This time, Alice waited patiently until it chose to speak again. In a minute or two, the caterpillar took the hookah out of its mouth and yawned once or twice, and shook itself. Then it got down off the mushroom and crawled away in the grass, merely remarking as it went, One side will make you grow taller, and the other side will make you grow shorter. Dragon Queen, hello! Thank you for dropping in tonight. It's good to see you. Uh, that's what hat she said. I I didn't know that someone was talking about a hat, Naruto. But yes, Dragon Queen, thank you for dropping in. How are you doing, Derry? One side of what? The other side of what? Thought Alice to herself. Of the mushroom, said the caterpillar, just as if she had asked it aloud, and in another moment it was out of sight. Alice remained looking thoughtfully at the mushroom for a minute, trying to make out which were two sides of it, and as it was perfectly round she found a very difficult question. However, at last... And I managed to lose my place. That shouldn't happen as often as it does. Uh, ba -ba -ba -ba. However, at last, she stretched out her arms around it as far as they would go and broke off a bit of the edge with each hand. And now which is which? She said to herself and nibbled a little off the right hand bit to try the effect. Oh, Dragon Queen, thank you for the follow. Hmm... That's what she said and Oh, Naruto's talking about the three inches part. Oh. Well, okay then. Ah, uh, three inches is a very pleasant height. I'm sure. Um. Yes. Yes, of course. The next... She nibbled a bit from the right hand bit to try the effect... The next moment, she felt a violent blow underneath her chin. It had struck her foot. She was a good deal frightened by this very sudden change, but she felt that there was no time to be lost, as she was shrinking rapidly. So she set to work at once to eat some of the other bit. Her chin was pressed so closely against her foot that there was scarcely room to open her mouth. But she did it at last, and managed to swallow a morsel from the left-hand bit. Hmm... Let's see here. Arm on Twitch, we've been using a fairly deep voice for some of these uh, little snippets that we've gotten, so let's give it a try. <clears throat> to bear as to not, may the thoughts set to slumber as I walk amongst the crowd underneath the cherry tree lumber. To care I give, I shall continue forth, although the day is not today I will trust myself worth. Something like that, Arm? Hmm, my head's free at last, said Alice, in a tone of delight, which changed into alarm in another moment when she found her shoulders were nowhere to be found. All she could see when she looked down was an immense length of neck, which seemed to rise like a stalk out of the sea of green leaves which lay far below her. <laughs> I'm glad you like it, Arm. Good water. 
<laughs> if you write an entire story and give me permission, I will be more than happy to read it on stream in whatever voices you choose. If you're going to put that much effort in, I'll be happy to meet you somewhere in the way. Um, if you don't already have me on Discord, um, I am in several different peoples, but uh, let me see if I can just find my handle real quick. Uh, that is my handle on Discord. You are more than welcome to uh, DM me if you have something that you'd like me to read. Um, and if there are specific stories that you'd like read, as long as they are not copyrighted or, uh, S uh, Naruto, seven discords it might be pretty small for the number that you and I are in together. Although, actually, I don't know how many people I'm in seven discords with. Um, but I am in far more than seven discords. Um, it's just that not all of them are shared with you, <laughs> and one would expect that. <clears throat> all right, um, but yes, thank you, Arm. What can all that green stuff be, said Alice, and where have my shoulders got to? And oh, my poor hands, how is it I can't see you? She was moving them about as she spoke, but no result seemed to follow except a little shaking among the distant green leaves. Mmm, <gasps> putting my vocal abilities through their paces? I'm down for this. It's fun to get experimental sometimes. As there seemed to be no chance of getting her hands up to her head, she tried to get her head down to them, and was delighted to find that her neck would bend about as easily in any direction, like a serpent. She had just succeeded in curving it down into the graceful zigzag and was going to dive in among the leaves when she found it to be nothing but the tops of the trees under which she had been wandering. When a sharp hiss made her draw back in a hurry, a large pigeon had flown into her face and was beating her violently with the, its wings. <laughs> Naruto, there is nothing wrong with sharing a discord with you. And I am in several discords. You are only seeing the ones that are shared between us, I suspect. Also, hello, Rage Demon. Thank you for dropping in. It's good to see you. How are you doing, dearie? Serpent! Screamed the pigeon. I'm not a serpent, said Alice indignantly. Leave me alone! Serpent, I say again! repeated the pigeon, but in a more subdued tone, and added with a kind of sob, Who oh, tried every way and nothing seems to suit them? I haven't the least idea what you're talking about. <laughs> Miss Fairy Tale. I do like the sound of that. Feel free to call me Miss Fairy Tale anytime you like, Naruto. And I'm glad you enjoyed your travels today, Rage. You'll have to debrief me on them later. I've tried the roots of trees, and I've tried the banks, I've tried hedges, the pigeon went on without attending to her. But those serpents, there's no pleasing them. Alice was more and more puzzled, but she thought there had been no use in saying anything more till the pigeon had finished. Uh, what's a bit interesting, Arm? Alice, uh, let's see here. As if it wasn't trouble enough hatching the eggs. But I must be on the lookout for serpents night and day. Well, I haven't had a wink of sleep in these three weeks. Can you steal the name as well? It's for a story character that you just came up with. Uh, which name are you looking to steal? I'm very sorry you've been annoyed, said Alice, who is beginning to see its meaning. And just as I've taken the highest tree in the wood, continued the pigeon, raising its voice to a shriek, and just as I was thinking I should be free of them at last, they must needs come wriggling down from the sky! Ah! Serpent! But I'm not a serpent, I tell you. I'm a... I'm a... 
Well, what are you? I can see you're trying to invent something. I am a little girl, said Alice rather doubtfully, as though she remembered a number of changes she had gone through that day. <laughs> Miss Fairy Tale, you go right ahead and steal that. There's nothing wrong with it. <laughs> hmm. A likely story indeed, said the pigeon in a tone of the deepest contempt. I've seen a good many little girls in my time, but never one with a neck so long as that. No, no, you're a serpent and there's no use denying it. I suppose you'll be telling me next you've never tasted an egg. I have tasted eggs, certainly, but little girls eat eggs quite as much as serpents do, you know. I don't believe it. But if they do, then why then if they're a kind of serpent is all I can say. Oof. I am regretting picking this particular voice for the serpent. Um, or for the pigeon that is quite obsessed with serpents. <laughs> Ooh, wow. Um, hmm. Gonna take just a moment to let things unbind so that I can, you know, get the sounds out properly. Are you okay, Rage? Seems like you've got a little bit of a shock on your face there. Why pick the squeaker voice? It's a squeaky bird. It's a pigeon. It's shrill. It's annoying. But, Naruto, what voice would you prefer for the pigeon? I'm certainly open to ideas. <laughs> All you can hear is, HEATHEN! <laughs> Love it. Oh. <laughs> you thought the voice would be right up my alley? I'm not quite sure what you mean there, Rage. Any rate, Naruto, if you've got another suggestion for what voice to use for the pigeon that is quite worried about its eggs, let me know. Oh, it fits me, does it? Well, that's interesting. Because here I've got so many voices. But if that's the one you like, I can certainly use that one for you later, Rage. <laughs> You're right, Naruto. It would be lovely if it didn't irritate my throat. And that's part of why I'm leaning into this a little bit. I would like to adjust it so it doesn't. Oh, Time Lord, good to see you. Thank you for dropping in. <laughs> and yes, it is a little bit straining, but it's meant to be that way. And I'm guessing the pigeon won't be here too much longer. But uh, I suppose we'll find it. also hydrate. I don't have a redeem for it, but all right. Let me pull out some... Fresh water here. Oof. Ooh. Pouring the water. Ugh. Burned through about half a gallon tonight so far. So, you know, not bad. Not bad. <laughs> and thank you for the follow time, Lord. Oh my goodness. Hydro pump? Oh! <laughs> a good voice actor doesn't throw out their voice while well, Scar did. Hmm. Regardless. <clears throat> I've also been reading for, what, uh, two hours, give or take now? So, uh, it's not unreasonable. <laughs> no redeem, fine, you'll just yell at me. Well, Rage, I can't do redeems yet. I need people to follow, I need to do enough of these streams, and they need to last long enough. Um, but, yeah, we'll get there, 
breaking on things. And all right. Uh, Drink water. Is that about what you're going for, Arm? Okay, more hydrate. <clears throat> Let's see. This was such a new idea to Alice that she was quite silent for a minute or two, which gave the pigeon the opportunity of adding, You're looking for eggs! I know that well enough! And what does it matter to me whether you're a little girl or a serpent? It matters a good deal to me, said Alice hastily. But I'm not looking for eggs, as it happens, and if I was, I shouldn't want yours. I don't like them raw. Well, be off then, said the pigeon in a sulky tone as it settled down again into its nest. Alice crouched down among the trees as well as she could, for her neck kept getting entangled among the branches, and every now and then she had to stop and untwist it. After a while, she remembered that she still held the pieces of mushroom in her hands, and she set to work very carefully, nibbling first at one and then the other, and growing sometimes taller and sometimes shorter, until she had succeeded in bringing herself down to her usual height. <laughs> water is very good for the voice. Rage, throwing a water bottle at me, I will try my best to catch it. <laughs> Uh, Kefri has another drink water. Okay. Uh, no agua? <laughs> What's wrong with the agua here? Raids, you've got a plan. Legal, welcome back. Thank you for the hugs. Thought you went to sleep, but I'm delighted you've chosen to stay up a little bit here. I'm sorry if the squeaking woke you. <laughs> We've got a little bit of a squawky bird here. Mm -hmm. It was so long since she had been anything near the right size that it felt quite strange at first, but she got used to it in a few minutes and began talking to herself as usual. Come, there's half my plan done now. How puzzling all these challenges are. I'm never sure what I'm going to be from one minute to another. However, I've got back to my right size. The next thing is to get into that wonderful, beautiful garden. How is that done, I wonder? And as she said this, she came suddenly upon an open place with a little house in it about four feet high. Whoever lives there, thought Alice, it'll never do to come upon them this size. I should frighten them right out of their wits. So she began nibbling at the right hand bit again and did not venture to go near the house till she had brought herself down to nine inches high. <laughs> All the squeaks. Well, Rage, they are done. It's not called Wator anymore. It's Agua, says Arm. That's fair. <laughs> not really squeaking. It's more of a squawk. I approve. Let's expand the vocabulary beyond squeaks and squawks. Sounds good. <laughs> uh, I'm surprised Legal hasn't started pulling out that cute box again. <laughs> All right. Let's see here. I think we've got time to go for another chapter here. Chapter 6. Pig and Pepper. For a minute or two, she stood looking at the house and wondering what to do next, when suddenly a footman in livery came running out of the wood. She considered him to be a footman because he was in livery. Otherwise, judging by his own face only, she would have called him a fish, and rapped loudly on the door with his knuckles. It was opened by another footman in livery, with a round face and large eyes like a frog. A fish and a frog? Wait! When did Kira and Luli show up? Alice noticed had powdered hair that curled all over their heads. She felt very curious to know what it was all about and crept a little way out of the wood to listen. <laughs> oh, 
legal doing their very best to make sure everybody understands they're appreciated, wanted, and included. Good job, legal. Thank you. The fish footman began by producing from under his arm a great letter, nearly as large as himself. And this he handed over to the other, saying in a solemn tone, For the Duchess, an invitation from the Queen to play croquet. The frog footman repeated in the same solemn tone, only changing the order of the words a little. From the Queen, an invitation for the Duchess to go play croquet. Then they both bowed low and their curls got entangled together. Alice laughed so much at this that she had to run back into the wood for fear of them hearing her, and when she next peeped out of the fish footman was gone, and the other was sitting on the ground near the door, staring stupidly up into the sky. Alice went timidly up to the door and knocked. There's no sort of use in knocking, said the footman, and that for two reasons. First, because I'm on the same side of the door as you are. Secondly, because they're making such a noise inside, no one could possibly hear you. And certainly there was a most extraordinary noise going on within. A constant howling and sneezing, and every now and then a great clash, as if a dish or kettle had been broken into pieces. Please then, said Alice, how am I to get in? <laughs> Thank you for the wiggle, Naruto. There might be some sense in your knocking. The footman went on without attending to her. If we had the door between us, for instance, if you were inside, you might knock and I could let you out, you know. He was looking up into the sky all this time as he was speaking, and Alice thought decidedly uncivil. But perhaps he can't help it. Oh, but perhaps he can't help it, she said to herself. His eyes are so very nearly at the top of his head. But at any rate, he might answer questions. How am I to get in? She repeated aloud. I shall sit here till tomorrow. At this moment, oh, have a nice time, Arm. Thank you so much for joining. It was delightful to have you, and I hope you do send some stories my way. I'd love to see what you'd like to hear read out. At this moment, the door of the house opened. A large plate came skimming out straight at the footman's head. It just grazed his nose and broke to pieces against one of the trees behind him. Or oh, next day, maybe, the footman continued in the same tone, exactly as if nothing had happened. How am I to get in? Alice asked again in a louder tone. Are you to get in at all? That's the first question, you know. It was, no doubt. Only Alice did not like to be told so. It's really dreadful, she muttered to herself. The way all the creatures argue, it's enough to drive one crazy. The footman seemed to think this a good opportunity for repeating his remark, with variations on, I shall sit here, he said, on and off for days and days. But what am I to do? Anything you like, said the footman, and he began whistling. Oh, there's little use in talking to him, said Alice desperately. He's perfectly idiotic. He's perfectly idiotic. No, Alice. This frog clearly knows what's going on and is just not putting up with your antics. And she opened the door and went in. The door led right into the large kitchen, which was full of smoke from one end to the other. The Duchess was sitting on a three-legged stool in the middle, nursing a baby. The cook was leaning over the fire, stirring a large cauldron which seemed to be full of soup. There's certainly too much pepper in that soup, Alice said to herself as well as she could for sneezing. There was certainly too much of it in the air. Even the Duchess sneezed occasionally, and as for the baby, it was sneezing and howling alternately without a moment's pause. The only things in the kitchen that did not sneeze were the cook and the large cat sitting on the hearth and grinning from ear to ear. Well, I've heard of that cat before. Please would you tell me, said Alice a little timidly, for she was not quite sure whether it was good manners for her to speak first. Why your cat grins like that? What's a Cheshire cat, said the Duchess. 
And that's why, pig! She said the last word with such sudden violence that Alice quite jumped. But she saw in another moment that it was addressed to the baby and not to her. So she took courage and went on again. I didn't know that Cheshire cats always grinned. In fact, I didn't know cats could grin. They all can, and most of them do. I don't know of any that do, said Alice very politely, feeling quite pleased to have gotten into a conversation. You don't know much, and that's a fact. Alice did not at all like the tone of this remark, and thought it would be as well to introduce some other subject of conversation. While she was trying to fix on one, the cook took the cauldron of soup off the fire and at once set to work throwing everything within her reach at the Duchess and the baby. The fire irons came first, then followed a shower of saucepans, plates, and dishes. The Duchess took no notice of them even when they hit her, and the baby was howling so much already that it was quite impossible to say whether the blows hurt or not. "'Oh, please mind what you're doing!' cried Alice, jumping up and down in agony of terror. Oh, there goes his precious nose! As an unusually large saucepan flew close by it and nearly carried it off. If everybody minded their own business, said the Duchess in a hoarse growl, the world could go on a deal faster than it does. Which would not be an advantage, said Alice, who felt very glad to get an opportunity of showing off a little of her knowledge. Just think of what work it would make the day and night. You see, the Earth takes 24 hours to turn around on its axis. Talking of axes, said the Duchess, chop off her head! Alice glanced rather anxiously at the cook to see if she meant to take the hint, but the cook was busy stirring the soup and seemed not to be listening, so she went on again. At 24 hours, I think, or is it 12? I... Oh, don't bother me, said the Duchess. I never could abide figures. And with that, she began singing, nurse, nursing her child again, singing a sort of lullaby as she did so, and giving it a violent shake at the end of every line. Speak roughly to your little boy, and beat him when he sneezes. He only does it to annoy. Because he knows it teases. The chorus in which the cook and the baby joined. Wow! 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 While the Duchess sang the second verse of the song, she kept tossing the baby violently up and down, and the poor little thing howled so that Alice could hardly hear the words. I speak severely with my boy, I beat him when he sneezes, for he can thoroughly enjoy the pepper when he pleases. Wow, wow, wow. Here, you may nurse it if you like, the Duchess said to Alice, flinging the baby at her as he sp she spoke. I must go and attack. Get ready to play croquet with the queen. And she hurried out of the room. The cook threw a frying pan after her as she went out, but it just missed her. Alice caught the baby with some difficulty, as it was a queer-shaped little creature, and held out its arms and legs in all directions. Just like a starfish, thought Alice. The poor little thing was snorting like a steam engine when she caught it and kept doubling itself up and straightening itself out again, so that altogether, for the first minute or two, it was as much as she could do to hold it. As soon as she had made proper way of nursing it, which was to twist it up into a sort of knot and then keep tight hold of its right ear and left foot, so as to prevent it undoing itself, she carried it out into the open air. If I don't take this child away with me, they're sure to kill it in a day or two. Wouldn't it be a murder to leave it behind? She said the last words out loud, and the little thing grunted in reply. It left off sneezing by this time. Don't grunt. That's not at all a proper way of expressing yourself. The baby grunted again, and Alice looked at it very anxiously into its face to see what was the matter with it. 
There could be no doubt that it had a very turn-up nose, much more like a snout than a real nose, and also its eyes were getting extremely small for a baby. Altogether, Alice did not like the look of the thing at all. But perhaps it was only sobbing, she thought, and looked into its eyes to see if there were any tears. N no, there were no tears. If you're going to turn into a pig, my dear, said Alice seriously, I'll have nothing more to do with you. Mine now. Poor little thing sobbed again, or grunted. It was impossible to say which. And they went on for some while in silence. Alice was just beginning to think to herself, now, what am I to do with this creature when I get home? When it grunted again, so violently that she looked down into its face in some alarm. This time there could be no mistake about it. It was neither more nor less than a pig, and she felt that it would be quite absurd for her to carry it further. <laughs> I'm glad you're feeling comfy, Rage. So she set the little creature down and felt quite relieved to see it trot away quietly into the wood. If it had grown up, it would have made a dreadfully ugly child, but it makes a rather handsome pig, I think. And she began thinking over other children she knew who might do very well as pigs, and was just saying to herself, if only one only knew the right way to change them, when she saw when she was a little startled by seeing the Cheshire cat sitting on the bough of a tree a few yards off. <laughs> I'm glad you're having a comfy time too, Caffrey. The cat only grinned when it saw Alice. It looked good-natured, she thought. Still, it had very long claws and a great many teeth, so she felt it ought to be treated with respect. Cheshire Puss, she said rather timidly. She did not at all know whether it would like the name. However, it only grinned a little wider. Come, it's pleased so far, thought Alice, and she went on. Would you tell me, please, which way I ought to go from here? That depends a good deal on where you want to go, said the cat. I don't much care where. Then it doesn't matter which way you go. So long as I get somewhere, Alice added as an explanation. Oh, you're sure to do that. If only you walk long enough. <laughs> Alice felt this would not be denied, so she tried another question. What sort of people live about here? In that direction, the cat said, waving its right paw around, lives a hatter, and in that direction, lives a march hare. Visit either you like, they're both mad. But I don't want to go among mad people. Oh, you can't help that, said the cat. We're all mad here. I'm mad. You're mad. How do you know I'm mad? You must be, or you wouldn't have come here. Alice didn't think that proved it at all. However, she went on, and how do you know that you're mad? To begin with, a dog's not mad, you grant that. I suppose so. Well then, you see, a dog growls when it's angry and wags its tail when it's pleased. Now I growl when I'm pleased and wag my tail when I'm angry. And therefore I'm mad. It is creepy. I'm doing my best to creepy it up. I call it purring, not growling. Call it what you like. Do you play croquet with the queen today? I should like it very much, but I haven't been invited yet. Mm, you'll see me there, said the cat, and it vanished. Alice was not much surprised at this. She was getting so used to queer things happening. While she was looking at the place where it had been, it suddenly appeared again. By the by, what became of the baby? I'd nearly forgotten to ask. It turned into a pig, Alice quietly said, if it had just come back in a natural way. I thought it would, said the cat, and vanished again. 
Alice waited a little, half expecting to see it again, but it did not reappear, and after a minute or two, she walked in the direction of the March Hare. I have seen Hatters before. The March Hare will be much more interesting, and perhaps this is May, it won't be raving mad. At least, not so mad as it was in March. As she said this, she looked up, and there was the cat again, sitting on the branch of a tree. And did you say pig or fig? I said pig. And it'd be nice if you wouldn't keep appearing and vanishing so suddenly. You make one quite giddy. All right, said the cat, and this time it vanished quite slowly, beginning with the end of its tail and ending with the grin, which remained some time after the rest of it had gone. Well, I've often seen a cat without a grin, but a grin without a cat, it's the most curious thing I ever saw in my life. She had not gone much farther before she came inside of the house of the March Hare. She thought it must be the right house because the chimneys were shaped like ears and the roof was thatched with fur. It was so large a house that she did not like to go nearer till she had nibbled some more of the left-hand bit of mushroom and raised herself up to about two feet high. Even then, she walked up toward it rather timidly, saying to herself, Suppose it should be raving mad after all. Oh, if only I'd gone to see the Hatter instead. <laughs> oh, it sounds absolutely terrifying, and Alice is definitely mad. I would believe it, Naruto. This far in, I can't imagine it any other way. All right, uh, we have been at this for just about two and a half hours here, and it is getting late enough that I really should be considering retiring for the night. Mad Hatter is somehow worse than the cat. Hmm. Well, we are almost to a mad tea party, and we would be over halfway there. Oh, you're most welcome! <laughs> <laughs> that is the... I don't know what your autocorrected there, but <laughs> it certainly made a thing. <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, does anyone have a particular request for the raid tonight? <laughs> Kefri, <laughs> you goober. Uh, coming from you, I'll accept that. And thank you for the headbats. Uh, let's see here. Doggone it, my creator dashboard doesn't actually tell me who's live right now. And that probably echoed a bit more than I want it to. Uh, let's see here. No requests from Naruto. I do see a few people online, but this late at night, I don't really know any of them that well, so I'm not certain. Um... So, might give it just a little bit here. Um, so, as we're kind of wrapping things up, um, I know she isn't currently here, but I would like to give a big shout out to Luli Lura, who was responsible for uh, making this overlay that you see here. Um, while I've done a few, you know, pieces to give her an idea of what I was looking for, she just Grew this thing together and handed it to me and is like here have an awesome so i really appreciate that she did that um if you get a chance to follow her let's see if i can actually get her name right because she's got a few different accounts um let's see here um BT or TV? Hmm. Oh, there's no underscore, that's why. So she's responsible for making the overlay that we see here. Um, 
I would like to also extend a big thank you to someone who... Yeah, Luli is the one who made my overlay. And so if you do get a chance to follow her, um, she's not... No, she's not live right now, but she's... Uh, we're not raiding her. I gave a shout out to her, Caffrey. <laughs> <laughs> she made the overlay. I want people to know that she's around. Uh, she's a little bit grumpy, but she's an absolutely delightful watch. And if you could... <laughs> yep. Uh, Kefri, do you have anyone who you would recommend? Who would be live at 12 a.m.? Well, uh, I know Ava Unit is live right now, and that's kind of who I'm leaning toward at this point. Um, if for no other reason than I actually know who they are. Uh, could also so Ava Unit's doing VR chat, which is going to be similarly chill vibes. Uh, Amaranth is doing Horizon Zero Dawn, which I suspect is going to be not so chill. Um, and the other people that I see are um, Australians and Insomniacs. Thanks! <laughs> um, I'm not sure which you're counting me as, but I'll roll with it. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, pa, do you see anybody that you'd like me to try raiding out here tonight? <laughs> Insomniac, definitely. Thanks, Naruto. <laughs> um... No, I will be raiding out. We, we've actually got a fair number of people here tonight, and I think that's appropriate to, you know, kind of pay it forward a little bit, because I really appreciate everybody who came in through raids and who just came in to see what's going on. So, once, uh, Katsumikatsu. Canadian <laughs> or Insomniac? <laughs> uh... Alright. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, yeah, I think we could definitely raid out to that person. Uh, let me get the raid set up here. A dragon? Well, now that's a good reason to raid someone, too. All right, so thank you once again, everybody, for joining in. I hope you enjoyed Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. Uh, we got just over halfway through it, so I think the next session we'll be able to actually finish it. And uh, maybe once we're done with that, we can switch over to doing some stuff in Blender. Uh, in the meanwhile, a big thank you to everybody who dropped in. Special thanks for Neko Kitty and Road to Dusk for raiding me. I'm not saying that, Naruto. No. Uh, and with that, I think we're going to kick the raid off, but it's been a lovely time, and I hope that you'll all join me next time when we open up the story circle once again. <laughs>